You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 223, our 31st QA. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? I'm sweating, Trey. Huh, you and me both. So that must mean you're actually in my state of Texas. It does. As we're recording this, I am uh, in the Dallas area, and man, is it hot. <laughs> it is hot. It is that. And what's even what makes it even hotter, Mike, is when your air conditioned unit goes out, which is what I'm <laughs> suffering. So, it are makes you serious? It, yes, it makes it even hotter. It's not wow. fun. I'm sitting here right now, sweating as we're talking. Boy, oh so boy. Just know yeah. however bad you have it, just know that I have it just a little bit worse than you. Yeah, well, I'm in a hotel, so it's not bad now, but, yeah. you know, out right. and about, it's hot. Right, right. So you were doing some French pop recording. Yep. I take it. So yep. how'd that go? Anything to report there went, on that end or anything? Went well. You know, we got our full uh, crop of episodes. We got 10 or, 10 or 12, depending on how we divide things up. So, yeah, we had a good week. Well, that's good. Well, I guess maybe yeah. since we're talking about other shows, Mike, we ought to uh, remind people about our paranormal show. I think yeah. we've got a three-part good series about quantum physics and metaphysics. Uh, part one's out now, and over the next uh, two months, the other two parts will come out. So if you mm-hmm. haven't checked out our paranormal show. Yeah, here. people are already they're already talking about that. We had uh, we did two interviews for Fringe Pop this week, and both, uh, again, without giving away too many details. Uh, both people we interviewed were heavily involved in the new age and uh, Satanism and j- just stuff like that. And, you know, they were very familiar with the, to put it unkindly, uh, gobbledygook that sort of gets passed off as metaphysical commentary or theology based on quantum physics. So it's a really timely series. Also, Mike, I want to, let people know that um, last week we opened up the voting for the next book of the Bible that we're going to cover on the podcast. And um, the voting ends July 12th at 12 PM and that's central time. So Mm -hmm. that's Thursday, July 12th at 12 PM central standard time is when the voting will end. So you got at least another week or so to vote. So go do it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, make sure you vote. There you go. You can get it on Facebook. You can get it on nakedbiblepodcast.com website or drmsh.com website to vote. And um, all right, Mike. Well, this episode, um, we actually have about six questions from two people. So mm-hmm. we're going to tackle a bunch of questions here. I'm ready if you are. Yeah, let's jump into it. Our first one is from Margo. I have read arguments that Caleb, a prince of Judah, was most likely a Gentile convert. And I've also read arguments that Caleb was most likely not a Gentile convert. This seems to be a lively topic in Messianic circles, with Messianics favoring a Gentile origin for Caleb. Do you take a position on this question? Yeah, we should tell everybody. I, Trey, let me see the uh, the, the questions here, and, and it's fortunate that he did. Because this question is extremely complicated. We're, we're probably going to take half the episode uh, to address this question. Um, so it was good to get a, a heads up. And I, what I decided here was rather than trying to wing it, since it is so complicated, you know, in the interest of time and clarity, I'm going to quote at length uh, on and off from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary articles on Caleb which the, that one's by Mark Fretz and Raphael Panitz, and the article on Kenaz, uh, which is by a different author whose last name is Kuntz. We're going to have to hit both of those, and I'll, I'll make some summary comments along the way to you know, try to tighten things up here. But you know, I don't really know why um, the Messianic movement cares about this. Uh, when, after I'm, I go through the material, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture a guess here. Uh, at least part of the Messianic movement. But I I really don't see any importance to it one way or the other. And I think in the end, um, you'll see it's it's a bit of a moot point because 
does it really make much of a difference if some if someone was born into Abraham's lineage or married into it, you know, or absorbed into the the family of Abraham, the family of God, um, at some other point or in some other way. So I, you know, I don't know why it's important, but we'll just we'll just jump in here. The first thing we have to sort of establish here is that there are actually three people in the Old Testament with that are named Caleb. So Fretz and Panitz write this to, to summarize kind of the uh, getting into the topic here, at least the at least the beginning part here. They say any discussion of the name Caleb and its variant form must of necessity also entail an investigation of the Calebites or the descendants of Caleb. Uh, and that's going to become an issue, uh, as we'll see. It's kind of important because depending on sort of which Caleb you're talking about, it's going to involve geography and sort of you know towns and things within a certain geographical area that, that get uh, absorbed into the tribe of Judah. So uh, sidebar here before we, we jump you know, back into the three candidates or the three Caleb's here, the root, you know, someone might be out there wondering if this has anything to do with the question. And I actually don't know, but I'm, I'm just throwing this out here. But the root of Caleb is KLB, okay, you know, Kaf Lamed Bet in Hebrew, which means dog. And, and that should not be presumed to be automatically a pejorative or a negative thing. The root occurs in basically every Semitic language, and it can indicate either some sort of self-abasement or debasement, that would be the negative connotation, or it can denote faithful servant, like you know, faithfulness as in just servitude. So you'll actually see, if you, if you ran a concordance search on Caleb, of the Hebrew term in the, through the Hebrew Bible, you'd get examples in the Bible of both a negative and a positive uh, connotation. So with that sidebar over, the, 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 let's go to the three Caleb's here, because there are three of these guys, and they all, this is where it gets kind of kind of convoluted. You have to sort of land on one uh, for the sake of the question. So again, quoting from Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary article on Caleb, uh, the frets and panets write, the son of Jephunneh, and the representative of the tribe of Judah among the 12 spies sent out by Moses to reconnoiter the land of Canaan is you know, sort of the first one. That's the one everybody thinks of. In contrast to God prohibiting the people from entering the land because they rejected his recommendation, God singled out, quote, my servant Caleb, unquote, and promised to bring him into the land where he had gone and to give it to his descendants as a possession. It's Numbers 14. Also, Numbers 26, Deuteronomy 1, 36, so on and so forth. This promise set Caleb apart from all his peers, even Joshua, and it raises the issues of geographical location and genealogical identification of Caleb and the Calebites. And continuing, the land that came to be owned by Caleb through apportionment, that's the you know, doling out by lot, you know, to the tribes, the land of the tribes, Joshua 14 and 15. So the, the land came to be owned by Caleb through apportionment, through force. Again, he has to go and, and fight for it, or a combination of the two, uh, t the, the, these two means, was associated with Hebron and Devir in southern Palestine. First Samuel 30, 14 identifies part of this area as, quote, the Negev of Caleb, unquote. If we identify the cities and boundaries of the tribe of Judah, it becomes obvious that the land owned by or associated with Caleb is located within Judah's borders. And the reference for that is Joshua 15, 1 through 12. Hebron is a key element in this association, in part because of its proximity to other Judahite cities. But in light of the centrality of the Davidic dynasty in the biblical tradition, it was as the first capital city of David, that Hebron played an unquestionable and an important role. Note that Nabal, Nabal or Nabal, the first husband of David's wife, Abigail, was a Calebite who lived in this region. That's 1 Samuel 25, 3. Now, that, we'll stop the quote there just to say, here's, at this point, you know, that's the guy we're all thinking of, okay, that the question is really targeting but it's actually at this point where things get complicated. 
uh, with the other two Caleb's. So going back to the article, we'll read uh, some more. So, so quote, in First Chronicles, several genealogies contain the name Caleb, and these reflect inconsistencies of lineage and raise questions in light of the other biblical information about individuals named Caleb. First, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is only explicitly mentioned in a genealogy of the sons of Kenaz, or the Kenizzites, that's First Chronicles 4, 13 through 15, which is set within a section concerning the descendants of Perez. The daughter of this Caleb is named elsewhere as Aksa, that's Joshua 15, 16, and 17, and Judges 1, 12 through 13. While an Aksa is listed as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron. So you got one, you know, you got this daughter of Caleb uh, in those references. Then you have a daughter of Caleb listed uh, as, the, as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron. So you've got you got the Jephunneh guy, the, the Jephunneh Caleb. Now you got the Caleb, the son of Hezron here. Aksa is listed as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron, and a grandson of Perez. Second, the Masoretic text never identifies the wife of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So, you know, right away you think, well, are they the same? Are they different? What's going on here? Back to the quote. However, Caleb, the son of Hezron, has several wives and concubines. And his descendants are not easily placed in his genealogy. It's First Chronicles 2, 18 through 24, 42 through 55. One identifiable descendant, Bezalel, First Chronicles 2, 20, a great grandson of Caleb, the son of Hezron, was a contemporary of Moses, according to Exodus 31, 2 and 35, 30. And therefore, that one, you know, he, he can't be the great grandson, or excuse me, can't be the great grandson of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So right away we're we're, we're getting a confusion here with Caleb, these two Caleb's and the relatives. They they you know they they can't be the same. So third, a Caleb, the son of Hor, can be identified according to the Masoretic text of First Chronicles two fifty, but according to his genealogy, First Chronicles two forty two through fifty five, this Caleb appears to be his own grandfather. Fourth, the names of some of Caleb's descendants are place names. In other words, they're not people names, they're place names. Tekoa, Ziph, Madmana, and Hebron, which complicates an attempt to understand the purpose of the genealogies. Now, Williamson, in his New Century Bible commentary on First and Second Chronicles, resolves these problems by assuming that the chronicler pulled together most of the genealogies but was not concerned with the details of genealogical consistency. Rudolf, who is a German scholar, on the other hand, attributes the inconsistencies to later editions, which disrupted the consistencies of the chronicler's composition. It is generally agreed that one section, 1 Chronicles 2, 42 through 50, derives from a tradition which predates the chronicler probably from the United Monarchy or shortly thereafter. That's according to Williams' uh, his opinion in his New Century Bible commentary. Now, the Anchor Bible article continues and says, the key to resolving the tensions in these genealogies is the fact that Caleb is part of Judah's genealogy. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is a Kenizzite who gained special status through his deeds in the wilderness wanderings and the conquest stories. On the other hand, Caleb, the son of Hezron, plays a role only in the genealogies of Judah, and Bezalel, the tabernacle builder, seems to be the central character in his genealogy. The chronicler does not attempt to relate Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, to Caleb, the son of Hezron because neither of them is central to his purpose of establishing a royal and cultic origin in the tribe of Judah. And that's the opinion of Williamson on page 52 of his commentary. Caleb the Kenizzite is important, rather, because of things he did, Numbers 13 and 14, Joshua 14, and the associations he had, Joshua 15, Judges chapter 1. Outside the chronicler's framework, let me read that sentence again without the verse references. Caleb the Kenizzite is important, rather, because of things he did and associations he had outside the chronicler's framework, although these were not unknown to the chronicler. Therefore, in addressing the questions raised above, Caleb the Kenizzite, who appears in 1 Chronicles 4.15, within the lineage of Perez, is to be identified with the individual so well known 
from the tradition of Calebites in southern Palestine, Numbers 13 through 14, and Joshua 14 through 15, to ask whether his daughter Aksa is the same as the daughter of Caleb, the son of Hezron, in 1 Chronicles 2.49, misses the point of the genealogy, at least in, in, in Chronicles. So you know, we have to distinguish these two. Now to continue again with a quote just a little bit more, this introduces the final issue of the function of genealogies. According to Wilson, and I a little rabbit trail here, Wilson is, is one of the recognized experts in biblical genealogies. He's got a bunch of articles and, and a book on it. Uh, according to Wilson, genealogies can be used to delineate social and political ties. Now catch that, social and political ties, not necessarily blood ties, okay? Social and political ties between two groups. And in particular, to incorporate marginally affiliated clans into a central group. So I'll stop here just to make the point again. Genealogies are not always about lineal biological descent. They can be about social and political relationships. Okay, back to the quote. The genealogy of Caleb is related in this way to the tribe of Judah, that is socially and politically and was assimilated into the Israelite tribal system thereby. Not only the individuals and groups of people, but the places associated with them become part of the tribe of Judah. Thus, the genealogy provided a means for legitimizing social relations and for defining the geographical domain of the individuals or groups concerned. And here's their their conclusion. It would appear that Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is the name of a Kenizzite whose personal exploits became the tradition of the clan which took his name as a patronym. That's who the clan is named after. This clan existed independently in southern Palestine, but through political, economic, and religious ties, it eventually became part of the tribe of Judah, even within the larger Israelite tradition. The distinctive stories of the Calebites were retained into the post-exilic period. Now, that's the end of the... uh, Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary article on Caleb. And, and the thing to, to take away from this is that you could see why some would insist that Caleb is an Israelite because of this relationship to Judah. But what the article points out is that you can't rely on the genealogies to talk about biological relationships, blood relationships. Sometimes genealogies are about social and political circumstances. And again, the, the evidence points to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which is the, you know, the, the Caleb that everybody's thinking about with the conquest story, that that Caleb, he, was, he and his relatives, he and his tribe were incorporated into Judah, not because of blood relationships. They're not Judahites, but the incorporation of Caleb and, and that tribe into Judah is based really on geography and political relationships and social relationships that that really are are tied to geography. So now that last paragraph, it would appear that Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, is the name of a Kenizzite, again, who's from southern Palestine. That last paragraph means we now need to think about Kenizzites. Okay, what's up with them? And for that, I'll go to a different article in the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, the article on Kenaz, that's K-E-N-A-Z, for those of you who have that resource. If you don't have the resource, I highly recommend it. It's very detailed. The Kenizzites are ostensibly related to Kenaz, but there are three Kenazes in the Old Testament. Uh, So here's how the article, or the author of this article, his last name is Kuntz, summarizes the three Kenazes. He says, quote, first, there is Kenaz, the son of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau and Adah. That's Genesis 36, 11, 1 Chronicles 1, who functioned as an Edomite clan chief. Again, according to Genesis 36, 15 and 42. Though Kenaz of Genesis 36, 11 is ordinarily understood to be the eponymous ancestor of the Kenizzites. In other words, their remote uh, progenitor. According to Genesis 15, 19, Kuntz writes, this connection is not buttressed by hard evidence. Second, there is Kenaz, the younger brother of Caleb and the father of Othniel. That's Joshua 15, 17, Judges 1, 13, 3, 9, and 11. In 1 Chronicles 4, 13, Kenaz is credited with a second son, Sariah. 
Third, there is Kenaz, the grandson of Caleb through Elah. That's First Chronicles 4.15. The plural gentilic adjective, that's, that's sort of a people, gentilic refers to a people group term. The plural gentilic adjective Kenizzites surfaces but one time in the Old Testament, Genesis fifteen nineteen, within a promise that Yahweh makes to Abraham in a theophany, listed in second position just after the Kenites, this is one of ten peoples whose land Yahweh intends to deliver to Abraham's descendants. In the singular form, this gentilic adjective is three times attested, Numbers 32.12, Joshua 14.6, and verse 14. In the phrase, quote, Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, this predication probably should be associated with the Kenizzites of Genesis 15.19. The Kenizzites were a non-Israelite ethnic group that presumably penetrated the Negev from the southeast. What little is known about them emerges mainly from consideration of their wider geopolitical context. Though scholars lack the necessary data for reconstructing the early history of these tribes in any detail, it is nonetheless clear that owing to the prominence of David and the increasingly sturdy position of the tribe of Judah from whence he came, these southern tribes were eventually subsumed under the category of, quote, greater Judah. From the narrative in Numbers 13 and 14, we may infer that the Calebites settled into the city of Hebron, and these non-Israelite, non-Israelite people set, settled into the city of Hebron and subjected its quite promising agricultural environments to their advantage. In Joshua 15, 13 through 19, and Judges 1, 11 through 15, which is its parallel, the spotlight falls on the Othnielites. We are told that Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the younger brother of Caleb, took possession of the city of Devir, southwest of Hebron. Though the text is too laconic to be of much help to biblical historians, it does attest that the Othnielites, residing in the hill country directly southwest, southwest of Hebron, clustered around Devir. To the southeast of Hebron, the Kenites held sway in the vicinity of Arad, according to Judges 1.16. The precise extent of the territories claimed by the Calebites, the Othnielites, and the Kenites is unknowable. Last you know, section here. Several biblical genealogies denote that the Kenizzites, Calebites, and the Othnielites were closely related tribal groups, and that from their tent encampments along the foothills of southern Palestine, all three maintained intimate associations with their eastern Edomite neighbors. Caleb and Othniel are both recognized for their genealogical linkage with Kenaz. In due course, the Kenizzites and other neighboring southern tribal groups became thoroughly absorbed by Judah. That's the end of the Kuntz article, at least what we'll quote from it. So you take all of that, and where you land is the best position seems to be that Caleb is not an Israelite but that he and his family or his tribal group were absorbed into Israel, becoming part of Judah. Now, I, I, again, as I said at the beginning, I really don't have any idea why this is an interest to Messianic Christians. It's no shock that outsiders became part of Israel in the Old Testament period. Rahab did. Job was from Uz, which is Edomite territory. Othniel is one of the judges. He would have also been an outsider. God uses outsiders and makes them part of his people. If anything, Caleb and these other examples show non-Israelites becoming part of Israel. That's not news. Uh, I hope that this isn't some sort of quirky argument used by Hebrew roots folks. Again, that's a subset of the Messianic, uh, the, the Messianic, uh, I guess, category. So I hope it's not some argument used by Hebrew roots people to say Gentiles need to become Jews. And the New Testament says the exact opposite. Gentiles are the seed of Abraham. That's a quote from Galatians 3. And heirs according to the promise. Also, point blank from Galatians 3. Not because of circumcision and not because of other laws, but because of Christ. Abraham is the example of faith apart from the law prior to his circumcision, and prior to the giving of the law at Sinai. 
So I don't know how much clearer the Bible can be on this sort of stuff. But if you want to make the Bible say what your group prefers, I suppose you're going to find a way. Unfortunately, this has become sort of routine for this little community in Middle Earth, you know, to prefer your pet position on something ahead of the gospel of the kingdom. But again, I'm just guessing on what might be the motive here. And that Hebrew roots is lurking behind this this question, not 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 on the part of the questioner, but this real interest in this or this I, I don't know if I can even call it a fight since I'm I haven't you know I, I don't lurk on uh, Facebook or anywhere else to to find out what Hebrew roots groups are saying. So I'm just guessing here. But if it is some sort of argument that Gentiles have to become Jews, it's a bad one. It's one that again just point blank ignores the language of the New Testament. And it ignores the fact that Abraham is is the, you know, he is the litmus test. I mean, he is the point of reference for Paul as the example of faith. It has nothing to do with his circumcision. It has nothing to do with the law. The law didn't even exist, and Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. I mean, God knew his heart, and he believed before he was circumcised. Again, I just don't know how much clearer this can be, but there are some that just kind of don't really care. Uh, so maybe Hebrew Roots is behind this, looking for another non-sequitur argument. I don't know. It's just a guess. All right. Sean has our next few questions, and he wants to know, in certain Bible passages, the angel of the Lord sometimes doesn't seem to mean what we say it means in terms of second Yahweh figure. Is the term sometimes used more generally? Also, does Matthew 28, verse 2, run counter to Jesus being the angel entirely? Yeah. In the Old Testament, let me just preface it by saying this. You know, you, you, you can't assume in the New Testament particularly that when it says the angel of the Lord in an English translation that we're talking about the Old Testament figure, it, it gets a little bit confusing because of translation. I'll try to explain that. In the Old Testament, the phrase Malach Yahweh, okay? is definite. When you see that that combination, it's called a construct phrase in Hebrew, Malach Adonai, Malach Yahweh, okay? It is the angel of the Lord by rule of Hebrew grammar. When you have a noun, Malach, messenger, angel, linked to a following noun that is definite, and Yahweh is definite, there's only one of those. Proper names, proper personal names are definite by definition in, in, in Hebrew grammar. When you have one noun joined to a definite noun, you, it makes the whole chain definite. So it's the angel of Yahweh. And so that, that, that's Hebrew grammar. There's no way in Hebrew to just say an angel of the Lord, just, just an angel of the Lord uh, in terms of the construct phrase. You'd have to have literally something like malach ladonai, that's Malach, it's preposition Lamed, plus the divine name, which never occurs uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, you only get Ladonai and Malach in the same verse four times, but they're never in a possessive construction. So you, you really don't have in, in the Hebrew Bible a, a way to say an angel of the Lord. When you have this construct phrase, it's always definite, the angel of the Lord. That is not the case in Greek, and it's not the case in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you can express you can express an angel of the Lord, just an indefinite one, uh, because Greek allows you to do that. It doesn't have the same rules, uh, syntactical, grammatical, syntactical rules as Hebrews. And Matthew twenty eight two is actually an example. There's no definite article, the word the before angel, angelos, in that verse, and the genitive relationship in Greek does not require definiteness. So. A good translation is an angel of the Lord. There's no, there's no necessary link back to that figure in the Old Testament. It's just generic. It's just it's indefinite. Now I'm going to read a little a little section from a footnote from my forthcoming Angels book where I talk about this. So nice little commercial here for the Angels book. Um, this is just part of a footnote. I wrote the phrase "angel of the Lord" occurs eleven times in the New Testament. Only once does it occur with the definite article, suggesting a translation, the angel of the Lord. That's Matthew one twenty four. It is the angel of the Lord, 
Again, Ha Angelos Koryu, definite article before Angelos. It is the angel of the Lord who tells Joseph to marry his betrothed, Mary, because her conception, which would be Jesus, is from the Holy Spirit. There's no conflict between this occurrence and the idea that Jesus and the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament are the same second person of the Trinity. Trinity. The definite article in Matthew 124 is it, it's there, the definite article is there, it's used to refer back to the angel who appeared to Joseph, a specific angel, in a dream four verses earlier in Matthew 120, where the phrase lacks the article. So in Matthew 120, you have you have angel of the Lord without the article. And then four verses later, as the story continues, the writer Matthew puts the definite article in front of Angelo, you know, Angelos Kuryu to make sure that you know that, that this angel I'm talking about now is the one that I talked about four verses earlier. That is a function of the definite article in Greek. The article preceding Angelos is in grammatical parlance, grammarians call anaphoric. That is, quote, it denotes previous reference, reminding the reader of who or what was mentioned previously, which is the most common use of the article and the easiest usage to identify. That's a quote from Dan Wallace's book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics and Exegetical Syntax of the New Testament. So the presence of the article in Matthew 124 is therefore not to be taken as the language that imitates the Old Testament wording. So that's the end of my footnote. So you, no, there's there's not a conflict here, but it's easy to, to you know kind of get a little bit confused because of the way English handles the, the phrases. You've mentioned before that the Trinity view of Genesis 3 was wrong because, among other reasons, why would God tell Jesus and the Holy Spirit something he already knew? But doesn't Jesus say that there are things only the Father knows? Right. Well, first, first of all, my comments didn't pertain to Genesis 3, so I think that, that's got to be a typo. Uh, my comment was in reference to the plural exhortation in Genesis 1.26, let us create humankind in our image, saying that's, that's, that's not a conversation between the Trinity, and in part because God doesn't need to announce something to the other members of the Trinity. They're co-eternal and co-omniscient, and they already know. Now, the answer to the question, doesn't Jesus say that there are things only the Father knows, is yeah. Yeah, Jesus doesn't know something that the Father does, like when the Lord's going to come back. But that was spoken when Jesus was incarnate. In the incarnation, the Son surrendered the independent use of his attributes. That doesn't mean he surrendered the attributes, by the way, just you know, the, 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 the use of them. He surrenders the, the, the exercise of them, and that was voluntary. It's limited by the incarnation and or the Father's will. I mean, just think about it. Jesus could also get hungry. He could get tired. He could die. He could get sick. You know, he, he had to learn things. You know, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God, men, Luke 2, 52. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, Jesus having these limitations doesn't mean, you know, he isn't God, but there's something, there's something different going on. He is limited by, by being incarnate, by having a body, by being a man. The other two members of the Trinity aren't men. They are not embodied. They're not humans. The second person becomes human, and that changes the circumstances. It doesn't change his, his divine ontology, but it changes, you know, again, the, the, his, his whole relationship to his attributes in terms of functioning as God in an unfiltered circumstance. And so my comment about Genesis 126 is a different context. It's pre-incarnation. The Son, the second person of the Trinity, was not limited. So it's perfectly fine to say, hey, you know, back in Genesis 126, all the members of the Trinity would have known the same thing, they're co-eternal, co-omniscient. There, there's no limitation on any of them. It's a different circumstance when Jesus, you know, because of the incarnation, when Jesus is incarnate. And so that's when you get this language of limitation, you know, where, where Jesus doesn't know something that the Father knows. So the circumstances are different. Sean's next question is, if Jesus conquered death and his kingdom is at hand, Mark 9, for instance, then why are principalities still called the rulers of this age? 1 Corinthians 2. He does say they are doomed to pass away. So is this more of the already but not yet phrasing? 
you know, let me take the first part of that. You know, why are they called rulers of the sage? It really, it's because that language is based on or derives from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Uh, they're they're described as you know it, it's true that the rulers, you know, you can have other terms here as well, in the New Testament are described as defeated, but but such titles, you know, the, these these sorts of labels are the way to identify. Uh, who he's talking about in the context of the Old Testament, specifically the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. You know, the fact that they are defeated, you know, moving to the, the, the rest of the question here, the fact that they are defeated and are progressively losing people and losing control is part of the already but not yet matrix of ideas. So I think uh, Sean is, is, is tracking well on this. Uh, as the Great Commission is carried out, you know, they're, they're going to be displaced. They have lost legitimacy of rule. Again, remember that that these rulers, to use, again, New Testament language, had their position by virtue of Yahweh himself giving it to them at Babel, with the disinheritance of the nations and assigning the nations to the sons of God. But the work of the cross, the plan, God's plan, the plan of the Most High, withdrew that authority or nullified that authority or terminated that authority. Their rule is now illegitimate. It's over. So, you know, because when when the whole incarnation, the cross event, the Son of the Most High comes again, and and part of his mission, the effect of his mission, is to reclaim the nations. And so their their legitimacy is over and done with. Gentiles are authorized, you could put it this way, to return to the family of God. God wants them to return. They are included now in the covenant with Abraham, again, back to Galatians 3. You know, you, if you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, he's speaking to, to the Galatians. He's speaking to a predominantly Gentile audience there. Um, they're included in the covenant with Abraham, but all of that doesn't mean that the supernatural powers hostile to God are not going to fight back or oppose God's will. I mean, goodness, they've been opposing God's will all along. So why would the cross event be any different? You know, the, the whole point of the language is that their, their authority over the Gentiles, over the nations, is illegitimate now. It has been removed by the, by the Most High who gave it to them. He has withdrawn it and terminated it. But that doesn't mean they're just going to roll over and say, oh, I guess we better be good now. I guess we better not be hostile to God. I guess we better not oppose God anymore. You know, that's what they've been doing the whole time. So you would expect them to resist, and that's what they do. And that's why, you know, Paul says, you know, our, our, our battle's not against, you know, flesh and blood, but against, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places and all that language. Is it merely coincidental that 1 Corinthians 6 begins with Paul mentioning judging angels and later in the verse discusses sexual immorality, which was the sin of the very angels we will judge? You know, I actually, I actually tend to think that it is uh, coincidental here, um, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. The reason is because the context, in the context, it's not the only statement. Like, you don't have the judging angels and then only talk of the sexual immorality. You actually don't even have the sexual immorality emphasized in the context. That the, the the problem when Paul brings up his comment that that you know you're going to judge angels is taking each other you know, to court is the lawsuit problem. And then he moves on to sexual immorality and some other things. You know, the, you've got theft, drunkenness, reviling, swindling in, in 1 Corinthians 6.10. Um, so there's a lot going on there. It's not just the judging and then the, the sexual immorality stuff. Now, if you had only the statement of 1 Corinthians 6.3, you will judge angels, and then you know, coupled with the sexual stuff, then if, if that was the pairing, if that was the, the, the two sides of the coin, so to speak, then I think a connection back to the transgression of the watchers might be in view. But since we don't have that sort of exclusivity, uh, I, I tend to think it is coincidental. Sean's last question is maybe counter to the last question. In Genesis 6, God doesn't seem to wipe out the Nephilim for merely being born but for the corrupting of humanity subsequently. Would God have been angry had they not corrupted man? Is there a distinction to be made here, or am I inferring something that isn't there? Would, does Jude 1, 6-7 indicate that the two are not distinguishable? 
Yeah, well, we, we have a problem here with, uh, with conflating two related but different things. Jude 1, 6 and 7 talks about angels who you know left their first estate. I think that's King James language. Uh, the angels that sinned is the parallel. You know, in 2 Peter 2, uh, ESV has angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling. They're the ones who end up in chains. Again, 2 Peter 2, the angels that sinned end up in chains in the abyss. So you have angels who sinned. Okay, the Nephilim are not angels. They're not the angels. You got two different things here. It's the watchers. Again, that's the Second Temple Jewish term. The watchers, that's the, the, the Second Temple Jewish, the Enochian term for the angels that sin, for the sons of God of Genesis 6. The Nephilim aren't those guys. The Nephilim are the, the byproduct. So, you know, the Nephilim are only in view in, in the biblical story in terms of there being a lethal threat later on, you know, their, their descendants being a lethal threat to the people of Israel during the conquest. And then they're also important because of the origin of demons. You know, when you, when you killed a Nephilim, then the disembodied spirit, that's what becomes known as a demon. And you get hints of that in like Ezekiel 32, Isaiah 14, when you have the Rephaim, you know, the, the, the disembodied Rephaim in Sheol in the underworld in the realm of the dead. They're, so there are little vestiges of it in the Old Testament, and it gets more developed in the Second Temple period. The whole idea of where where demons come from—they're the disembodied spirits of the giant clans, specifically the Nephilim. But the Nephilim are the ones who are the progenitors of the other ones. So we need to keep separate the angels that send or the sons of God, you know, who transgress, or the Watchers. The, the, those are all three terms that refer to these heavenly beings, okay, in Genesis 6. The Nephilim are not those guys. So, you know, I, I, I really don't know what else to add. I think that answers the question because the elements of the question sort of presume that the Nephilim are the angels, which is not the case. All right, Mike, that's all the questions we have for this episode. Again, I want to remind everybody to go vote on the next book of the Bible that we're going to cover here on the podcast. Voting ends Thursday, July 12th at 12 p.m. Central Time. So get your vote in. All right, Mike. Well, we want to thank you again for answering our questions. And I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.